So today I would like to talk about what the uh, feline immunodeficiency virus can teach, what we can know, what we can infer from this virus about the HIV. And so in the outline of my uh, talk, we divide in three parts. So first is to talk about the, the, the FIV. So uh, I will give you some description about the molecular and the epidemiological features of the FIV. I will talk just a little bit about the pathogenesis and why to work with uh, feline immunodeficiency virus is useful. And you know, I have in many, many times or whenever I speak with people, eventually we end up that I'm using cats for, for my research and obviously I had to try to defend myself to justify why uh, the FIV is useful to, for, for um, as you will see, for HIV, uh, for developing um, uh, therapies, the vaccines against the HIV, but also for many other things. So again, I would like to show you some why, why to work with the FIV is useful. And secondly, uh, I would like to talk uh, the, 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 go the pros and cons of using the FIV as an animal model for the HIV. I will show you some vaccine studies some that we did in the past very, very briefly and, and some latest results that has been just been uh, accepted a couple of days ago in, uh, in, uh, uh, for publication JVI. And, and third and last part, if we, have, you know, if we still have time, if you're not too tired, I would like to talk about the use of FIV as a vector. So as a link virus vector to vaccinate against uh, sexual transmitted infections, not HIV, I will, uh, as I will show you in, uh, uh, in a second. So <coughs> the, the, the FIV stories began, uh, began in 1987. Uh, so when um, a group from California discovered uh, a T lymphotropic virus from a cat which was obviously infected and was obviously um, uh, immune depressed. So he has an immune deficiency like syndrome. Uh, soon after this, uh, the, the virus was, they obviously they studied the uh, genomic structure and it became, became clearly evident that it was, uh, that this guy was an, um, a lentivirus. If you if you if you compare the the the, the, uh, the genome structures compared to the HIV, you'll see that the genomic structure is overall um, mostly the same. Uh, FIV like uh, BIV, the bovine immunodeficiency virus, or the other virus that infect uh, sheep, has fewer uh, regulatory genes as compared to the HIV. But uh, some of those, there are uh, some of the, for instance, the FIV or what is called TAT, that is. Uh, actually, as, as a different name of FIV, can um, uh, concentrate different functions that in HIV are, uh, are um, made from different proteins. So fewer proteins, but again, that are a broad, a broad range of activity as compared to the uh, HIV regulatory genes. Also, the, the uh, transcriptional map is very similar to the to the uh, to the HIV and interesting. Uh, um, and so on this I will be back in uh, later on. There are two genes that are constitutively expressed on, uh, even with, uh, in cells in which the uh, FIB doesn't really um, goes into a replication, a productive replication. So even, with, uh, even when there is no uh, production of lentiviral particles, there are two genes, uh, the ORFA that is similar but not identical to TAT and the REV gene that are constitutively expressed by these uh, virus. So from the phylogenetic point of view, the, uh, the FIV is, uh, as I say, is a typical lentivirus. It's closer as compared to the uh, lentivirus of the ungulates to the, uh, the non-human primates and the, and the HIV. So just to give, you, to give you some information about the uh, epidemiology, so the, the natural host of the FIV is the domestic cat, but there are similar viruses in other families. And even if the, the, the virus is species specific, so it can't be transmitted to non-human primates or man, etc., like it can be easily transmitted from different felids. Indeed, we, we can have lions or puma, even in captivity or in nature that are harbor the, uh, the FIV and, and the other way around. So you can have the lion immunodeficiency virus, so the puma immunodeficiency virus is also causing disease in their natural host that can be transmitted, they can infect uh, uh, the domestic cats. So those viruses are mainly transmitted by bites. 
So animals during uh, the fight, and they transmit, they mainly transmit the, the virus by biting the, uh, each other, but it's also, it has also been recognized the vertical transmission and also the sexual transmission. But again, in nature, the biting is the most prevalent, is the most prevalent route of transmission. Indeed, the virus can be uh, isolated. You can find the virus in saliva and, and the saliva glands soon after one week from infection. So it's, uh, and it's present at eye titer. So the prevalence varies with age. Obviously, the, the, the older the, the cat is, the most likely uh, they, they got the infection. So in the, um, I would say in the healthy cats, the prevalence of the FIV infection is around 2 or 3 percent. Obviously, the percentage varies quite a lot depending on the, on the geographical areas. But in animals in, that they are suffering from chronic diseases, any kind of chronic disease, the, the percentages can be as high as 40%. So it's, it's a virus that's highly diffused. And obviously, because of the route of transmission, males are more likely to be infected compared to females. And also, the lifestyle has a high incidence or uh, uh, really influence on the, on the uh, uh, FIV prevalence. Feral cats and shelters are uh, uh, cats living, living indoors in these conditions are more likely to be infected as compared to indoor cats. And as I said, the state of health also influence, uh, influence the percentage of transmission. Uh, like FIV, uh, HIV, there are several clades in the world. Most of them are, <coughs> you know, the, the, the prevalence of, of these, uh, the, the genotypes depending on the, the geographical area considered. There are at least five uh, subtypes. Probably there is uh, a sixth one that has just been discovered. And, and interesting, whereas in some geographical areas there is a mixer, for instance, in Japan, which, in which for unknown reason, the virus is highly prevalent. There is a very high incidence of FIV inf infection in Japan, no matter the cat lifestyle. Uh, also, in, in uh, North America, there are several subtypes. Uh, in Europe, and this uh, apparently this depends on the migration of population uh, across Europe in the, in the uh, all over, uh, you know, in, in across the centuries. Uh, we, we have a strange combination. So in southern Europe, uh, including Spain and Greece and uh, Portugal and uh, at the southern part of France and Austria, we have the uh, animals are mostly uh, infected with the B subtype, which seems also to be the oldest uh, subtype. Uh, and uh, in contrast, in the North Europe, UK, um, Scandinavia, there are uh, most of, of those animals are infected by the A subtype, a little younger, more pathogenic. And, uh, and in between, uh, for instance, in the southern part of Germany, you have a mix of, of both subtypes. We also have uh, recombinants. Recombinants are still, you know, uh, can be formed. We have animals that are, uh, have double infections. Sometimes they are triple infections. So, you know, it's, it's, it looks very similar to what we know about the um, HIV. So also, if you look to the natural history of, of infection, if you, know, it's, if you look just at this picture, this is what you observe in, uh, in HIV in humans. So we have a primary infection with a peak of, of, of uremia uh, that lasts for two, uh, let's, I would say, one or two months. And then you have a clinical latency in which the, you can still uh, observe or you can still detect the, the virus. And like in HIV, you have a huge variation. So there are animals we can ever very able to control the disease, and you can really f find any virus during the clinical la latency. Other animals which are not really uh, controlling the infection, so you have very, very high level here. And obviously, in animals with high viremia, the, the progression to the late stage of, of disease, so the flying ace is much faster. So you, you have animals that can live for, you know, for forever with infection without arriving to the late stage of disease. But we have animals that after the infection, two or three years, they, they are uh, of the overtly immune, immune depressed. And uh, mirroring the, the, the varemia, you also have uh, a CD40 uh, depletion 
that is very acute in the primary infection, then there's a partial recovery, but then there's a, prog a progressive decline until the, the final stage of disease. The symptoms uh, that they also observe during uh, in primary infection are very similar to the, uh, to the HIV. So you have the common symptoms of fever, neutropenia, generalized lymphatic tenopathy, but you can also observe diarrhea and depression. This stage is very, very uh, highly more, um, there is a highly mortality if the animals have other diseases, or especially if they are infected with uh, other pathogens, uh, first of all, the feline leukemia virus. So when the animals have a concomitant or, or pre uh, progress, uh, precedent infection with the uh, EFLV, the lethality at this stage is about 60%. So, but again, if the animal, the animal, they are able to recover and they stay well for, for a while until they arrive at the, at the feline age, that is, this uh, occurs to about 30, 40% of the animals living, you know, in, in nature, not in experimental condition. The feline age is characterized by a variety of diseases. You can have chronic infection, you can have tumors, you can have a lot of neurological abnormalities because the virus is also in the CNS soon after uh, two or three weeks of post-infection. And you have also other, other, other disorders. So nothing new. So this is similar, again, similar to what you observe in the HIV. So despite the, the, the virus, so the, the, the CD4 depletion is the main landmark hallmark of, of infection, the CD4 is not the receptor of the, of the uh, FID. So the receptor, the virus uses a, a co-receptor, the CXR4, so the same uh, used by HIV, and the virus also used uh, as a main receptor, use the CD134, which is an antigen which is expressed in the CD4 plus uh, T cells. So the cells need to be activated to be, to, to be infected by, by the virus that we'll show you later. So this, uh, this protein belongs to TNFR uh, super family and this has a different, uh, different um, functions in that. So the picture that we have, that we know, or that we probably uh, is following by, by the virus is that the, uh, the, the, the CD4 T cells are activated by either by uh, dendritic cells or other stimuli. So eventually the, the uh, memory T cells and activated CD4 T cells express the CD6 CR4 and the CD134 and with these the cells can become infected by either by the free virus or the virus that is uh, uh, presented somehow by dendritic cells and macrophages. What is also interesting is that the cells supporting FIV replications change across the infection. So during the acute phase, in the acute phase of infection, so again during the, the first two or three months, the virus can be found in the T lymphoid cells, again, activated T lymphoid cells, macrophages and dendritic cells. But uh, during the chronic phase, in the chronic phase, the, the, the spectrum of infections, uh, the, of the infection can be enlarged, but because you can find the virus, you can also find the virus in B lymphocytes, astrocytes and megakaryocytes, in very, very huge amounts. So the virus, changes across the infection and the change also changes the spectrum of the infection. Uh, obviously, in vitro can be also infected other cells, but this is not the, uh, the, the, the interesting. So <clears throat> it, we thought that the, the enlarged spectrum of infection depends by the fact that the uh, FIV isolates or FIV uh, strains from uh, isolated from the chronic infection seems to be less dependent on the uh, interaction with CD134. So if you remember, I, 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 I showed before that the virus to enter into the cells needs two uh, molecules, the co-receptor CXCR4 and the CD134. So those uh, molecules are used uh, mainly used during uh, from with uh, FIV isolates on obtained from the acute phase of infection. During during infection in vivo, in the chronic phase, you have several mutations that are mainly uh, shaping 
the, the V5, the var, um, uh, variable region number five and number four, and this variation seems to be uh, to allow the virus to enter into the cells without interaction with the CD134. So the virus containing some mutation here in the, uh, the, vi uh, the variable region number five and number four uh, don't, doesn't need interaction with CD134 to enter into the cell. So it only used the CXCR4. So we thought that by for this, re for this reason, uh, the virus can enlarge its trophies. So and um, uh, a, cons a consequence of this variation is also that the virus lose, progressively lose its sensitivity to neutralization. So the, 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 m most, the, the overwhelming majority of the viruses uh, isolated during the chronic infection, they are broadly neutralizing resistance. So about the picture that we have is about 80% of, of the viruses are completely resistant to neutralization by a large panel of heterologous serums. And even when they are, uh, they are neutralized, the title, the neutralizing title is very, very, is very low. And the viruses are also resistant to their autologous serum. So again, there are a complete um, you know, the, the virus tend to, to, to become completely resistant to, to um, the neutralizing antibodies that are formed during the infection. Interesting what we observed in a, in a, in a study that we did some, some years ago, but before we knew the, the, the viral receptor was new, and before we knew that those mutations were also influencing in the interaction with this receptor, we, we observed that if you inoculate a, a neutralization sensitive virus in vivo, it, during the first six, six months, he's uh, still neutralizing sensitive to, uh, I would say, to uh, a certain number of sera, but he becomes progressively more resistant to the autologous sera. So if you take the virus from, let's say, uh, a three months, uh, and it, if, you, if you measure this neutralizing activity of the, of the sera, collect at the same time, this virus is resistant, but if you take, for instance, uh, the, um, I would say the, the, the sera that has been, you know, uh, two or three uh, weeks after the, 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 the virus that you isolated, so this virus can be resistant to the, to the, to the sera that you collect a few, a few weeks uh, after. But this, uh, what we observe is that for a six, for a, I would say six or eight months, the virus is resistant to only to this autologous, is resistant only to this autologous sera, but it um, maintained the sensitivity to a large panel of sera. But after that, something occurs and the virus becomes a uh, complete resistance to a large panel of sera. And this, we, what we observe, is this depends on two mutations, either localized in the V4 region and another one localized in the V5 region. And the virus can balance, there is a, sometimes a covariation that both uh, mutations can be present, or sometimes only one or, or mutation can be present. And this Mutations. We, we we did some study with uh, with a guy with a, um, a guy working in Glasgow. With the guy who discovered the uh, the uh, CD134 as a main receptor. So we we observed that these whenever these mutations one or either mutation are present, the virus does interact anymore with the C1, CD134. <coughs> so again, there is uh, the the you know the the. Uh, immune system in vivo shape the virus, but the, what we observe, and probably is a difference with the, the HIV, is that in HIV, the, the way how the virus changes is much more stereotype as compared to the HIV. Okay, so you can narrow down to two or three point mutations localized in the V4 and the V5 uh, a region of the of the uh, the surface glycoprotein, and with this mutation, the virus can survive, can persist in spite of a strong near, um, humoral and uh, cell mediated immune response, and can also expand his, his tropism because it becomes less sensitive or less dependent on interaction with CD134 for its interaction. So why? Uh, that say why to work with the FIV useful? Well, first of all, because uh, obviously if, if well, any result that you observe is also good for the health health improvement. So we have a vaccine for the FIV, a vaccine which is not marketed in, in Europe. 
for several reasons that I want to show you, but the va the, the, this vaccine is not effective. So again, if obviously, if you are able to produce something that is good for, for, for the FIV, is also good for, for, uh, for the cats. It's a very good model for the HIV vaccine. It's a also a good model for HIV neuropathogenesis. I didn't went to the details, but the, va the neurological abnormalities that are observed in the animals, even in, during the acute phase of infection, are really very similar to what you observed before treatment in HIV. So the AIDS dementia complex is also a picture that you observe in cats. So this is, quite, I would say, it could be a better model, but it's a good model for HIV immunopathogenesis. Obviously, since we are working with cats, we have less regions as compared to non-human primates and humans. So this can be a limitation. It's a very, very good model for uh, HIV chemotherapy. So the, the, the FIV responds to the similar to the um, uh, protease inhibitor. So the second generation protease inhibitor works very well against the uh, FIV. The um, integrase inhibitors work with a superimposable uh, concentration and mechanism against the FIV integrases and also obviously the RT inhibitors work effectively against the FIV. So it's a good model to, 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 to study in vivo, you know, uh, new drugs or combination of drugs. So it's also a good model for a candidate vector for gene therapy. So <clears throat> what are the advantages or disadvantages to work to use the FIV as an, uni as an animal model for the FIV? So, <clears throat> The, the advantage is, is, a, is a natural host system. Obviously, the FIV infect in nature, the animals in nature, so you have plenty of, of animals either for a natural study or also for experimental infection. So again, it's a natural host system. So again, as I said, any progress will benefit cats as well as humans. The host obviously is easy to obtain even if we don't take animals from the streets. Obviously, we buy the animals, but obviously, as much cheaper as so compared to the non-human primates, as much more easy to house and to handle. And also, the FIV, and also important, the FIV is not infecting to humans. So there are not even been a single report showing that the uh, FIV can be or has been accidentally transmitted to um, to humans. So what are the disadvantages? So the animals are outbred. So they can't, a, each animal is different from the others. Again, you know, mimicking uh, what we observe with, the, uh, with the humans, but it can also be uh, uh, also seen as a limitation. There were some studies in which they tried to inbreed animals, but uh, after the second, third generation, the animals stopped to, to, uh, to reproduce themselves. So this is uh, still, we are still using uh, outbreak animals. There is, as I was saying, a relative shortage of immunological reagents, even if the, gar the gap between humans or non-human primates and, and feline are mm, getting uh, you know, uh, shorter, uh, smaller and smaller. So, uh, but the, the, the big disadvantage as compared to some uh, non-human primates is that the vaccine and drug efficacy must be measured mainly by using infections parameters. So I mean, the, the animals that are housed in P3 facilities or they, are, uh, they don't uh, get sick from infection. So they are infected, they can survive for years, sometimes they can develop uh, tumors, but you know, the, the feline aids, the, 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 the final part, you don't really normally observe the, the you know, a, an animal that really become deeply immune depressed. This is also, is all, um, is only be observed in nature, meaning that the, there are some cofactors, so probably because, you know, the immune system is continually stimulated by external agents from the animals that are living in, in, in nature. Some of them are really, are really clearly understood, but again, this is a limitation if you do some experimental study. It's very, very rare to see an animal who died of disease. Okay, so the animals are infected, they can survive, so they have some, obviously they can uh, uh, develop some problem, but in the long term, in the very long term, and meaning uh, 10 years or so. So again, to see if the, a vaccine or drug 
works, you have to look at if the, ga if the animals get infection or not. So this is uh, probably the, the, the most, uh, you know, the biggest limitation that we have with the animals. So let me tell you something about the, um, the FIV, the use of FIV as an animal model for HIV concerning the, the vaccine study. So uh, we, we started to, to use the, uh, the, the, this model uh, in uh, 1992 or 1993. We have a huge grant at that time. We were, we were very, very happy from the National Institute of Health and the director, uh, the, uh, Giovanni Battista Rossi, the director of the National Institute of Health, decided at, at the end of the, of the 80s to invest in the animal models for AIDS and they were three huge uh, investments, one for the non-human primates that are in Rome, another one in the FIV that was being set in Pisa, and the third one is in rabbits that was with uh, Oliviero Barnier in Genoa. So these, uh, these um, um, animal models, so the, uh, the project in Genoa was closed two, uh, two uh, years after because of lack of results and reliability. So we also eradicate their facility. They were you know, dismounted and mounted again in Pisa. So we, had, we still have, unfortunately, we don't use uh, as such extent that we use in the, in the early 90s. So we, we had two animal facilities, we had Niles Lab and so on. And so we started to use the, the, this animal in the beginning of the 90s. I went to learn about this model in, uh, um, uh, in Glasgow first, and then in Rotterdam, and then in Utrecht. So there were several labs across Europe that they, they are actually they are still using uh, the FIV. So the main topic, was, so the money came from study the, to try to develop a vaccine study. Obviously, uh, we, we also st uh, use the models to study the pathogenesis, uh, um, um, drugs, and so on. So I want to show you just, the, so these are some, not all, but some of the, of the vaccines that we tested along the years, and these are where the, these are being published. And as you see, uh, we, we only have a very good result. So we have a, a, a vaccine that was really affected and this vaccine was very crude. It, it can be used in, in humans, obviously. And there were uh, cells which were uh, infected and fixed. So this vaccine worked very well, but the problem that we had was that uh, there was a narrow wind, window of protection. So uh, the animals were protected, we confirmed several times. Uh, uh, if the animals were um, challenged, somewhere in between to three months to, uh, let's say, eight months after the last boost. So if, if the, 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 the time interval is too short, actually we, we observe enhancement of infection. And sometimes we have, an, so the, the, the vaccinated animals who are more prone to, to infections compared to naive controls. I know this sounds strange, but this, this uh, is, is frequently observed. So again, if, you, if, you, if the animals were challenging, were challenging between uh, four months and eight months of protect, of after, after the last boost, the animals were protected. And again, if, you, if the animals were left for you know, several months, let's say one year or so after the last, uh, the last boost, and we tried to recall protection by reboosting again, so the protection was not uh, recallable. So we don't know why, so we, we observe a narrow window uh, of protection. We have some, uh, you know, as again, a sterilized immunity, and I will show you in a, in a, um, in a second. So the animals, uh, so these vaccines also work in the, in the field. So we were very excited in the beginning, but then since we observed these uh, drawbacks, we didn't go any further with these vaccines. So we, we tested other, other approach, as you say, we had partial protection or marginal protection. We have uh, some results uh, with these that I'm going to show you, to show you after. So coming back to the, to the fixed infected vaccine. So we test this vaccine in the field and uh, we test the, this vaccine in a shelter where there, uh, there were at least four different isolates uh, 
circulating in this, in this shelter. But as you see, after uh, almost uh, over two uh, years of control, none of the vaccinated animals were in fact a four out, out of 11. So the animals who survived uh, were still there because it was an open shelter, so cats were free to go and so so only only um, so four of the unvaccinated animals actually they were treated with the adjuvants and were obviously so they were uh, controls four of these uh, got infected so it, it worked in the field and because of these results we actually patent this uh, this uh, way to to produce to produce this vaccine and the patent unfortunately lasted for five years and it was a very expensive part uh, Patent and actually, when I asked, uh, we asked actually the National Institute of Health, they were willing to, you know, extend the coverage. They were said that uh, we can help you, but if you pay, obviously, we, we are working a medical faculty. We are using the FIV as a model for humans, so we know that we knew that we didn't go anywhere with these vaccines. We say, okay is fine for us, so we can give it. And because of this, oh, I, I don't know if because of this, but certainly there is a, uh, there is a vaccine, a marketed vaccine that has been produ is produced by Fordodge that use exactly the same uh, combination, the same procedure that we use to produce the vaccine. So this vaccine make, uh, use a combination of infected cells and um, a whole virus and free virus. We also test the combination, it didn't work very well, but again, so they use the same combination and they use, uh, the, the, the difference between our, ours was that uh, uh, we use only against the subtype A, they mix, uh, they use uh, cells which are so two different population cells, one uh, infected by subtype A and, and, uh, and another infected by subtype D. So, but this is um, um, uh, available in US, in Japan, and not in Europe for, for one, uh, for two things actually. So this vaccine has to be uh, administered three do in three doses, three weeks apart, and then you have an annual booster. Obviously a very, very profitable market. Unfortunately, this vaccine, the protection rate obtained with this, uh, with this uh, vaccine is not very good. So if you see uh, with the primary, primary strain, so again, uh, uh, strains that are not easy to neutralize, they are uh, for dodge and the, the University of Florida, they would develop and pattern the way to, to produce a vaccine. They claim that they have between 60, uh, 60 to 80 percent protection against the intra subtype. So they, and these, they have, again, according to them, 100 prote uh, pro uh, uh, protection again, 100 percent protection against the inter subtype, subtype uh, challenge. In contrast, there are some other groups that they say that they, they were, were not able to observe any protection when they were using really strong challenges or challenges with highly pathogenic viruses. So the, probably the, the, the true is in between. So uh, according to Fort Dodge, the, 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 uh, with a field virus, the, the protection they can achieve is about 50 to 60 percent. So it's not a good vaccine, but definitely is, is, uh, is um, <coughs> is commercialized in, 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 in uh, uh, Japan, US, Australia. In Europe, Europe didn't license the, the, va the vaccine because you can't really distinguish between the infected and the, and the vaccinated animals. So if, you know, obviously, if you vaccine the animals, the animals develop an, an humoral response that is not distinguishable from uh, the infected animals. So this is something that for the EMEA was not really, um, you know, uh, a, a, good, uh, a good way. Uh, so it was not really acceptable as a vaccine because with the vaccine you had to have a, a test that allows you to distinguish very easily if a, an animal is seropositive because it has been vaccinated or because it was uh, uh, is infected. So for this reason, the, the vaccine is not available in Europe. So coming back and going to the last part of my talk, coming back to the, to the um, uh, last experiment that we did, and is, uh, so we, we use a, a prime boost approach, a very complicated one, and, but we were very happy about these, uh, these uh, uh, results. And again, this has to be um, 
I would say, uh, yeah, um, updated because it's just being accepted for publication in JVI. So what are, what are the, div the driving concept of these, of these uh, the strategies that we develop? Again, I want to anticipate, it's very complicated. I don't think it can be used, or it's not very um, used to, um, easy to adapt for mass vaccination, but it really worked very well, and so it was a, a proof of concept uh, a, a nice proof of concept experiment. So why, uh, what was the driving concept, what were the driving concept of these experiments? So we know that some people escape HIV infection despite being uh, repeated, uh, repeatedly exposed. So we are uh, sex workers or, or other people who are really get in contact with the HIV, but for unknown reason they were protected. So probably there are some way to, or there are some natural protection against the, the HIV. Also, we also saw that the conventional uh, vaccination strategy have failed to, 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 to confer uh, you know, uh, sufficient protection against HIV. So all the, the vaccination strategy that we use I mean, the, uh, of people working with the HIV or non-human primates, they didn't get any, any good results. And also, the, what we don't know, the, ma the major problem is that the factors which are responsible for protection remain elusive. So at the moment, we don't really know which is the, the right trigger. So we have some indication, but we don't know. But we, it also appears very likely that the protective immunity is probably triggered by nascent viral protein. So the protein has to be present in the right contents and it has to be not uh, uh, really uh, uh, like uh, the, the protein like these as uh, presented by the HIV itself. And also the protective immunity probably is likely to be multifactorial in, uh, in nature. But again, I was saying before, the, the factors involved uh, continue to escape identification and are only partially or totally distinct in uh, infected individuals. So the idea, so we, we took the idea from um, a recent uh, um, international AIDS vaccine initiative report in which we said, so the idea would be to, to build an individual armor against HIV. So no matter what are the, 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 the factors that are playing into a single individual, if you are able to produce an individual arm, so if you are able to produce a sort of a personalized vaccine, you can probably trigger or you can probably elicit the good uh, a protective immune response. So the, the driving idea was to engineer the autologous T lymphocytes, so the primary target of infection, the acute facial, so the, f the, the, the cells which are first targeted by the, uh, by the, the virus. So to engineer the autologous T lymphocytes in such a way to mimic the FIV infected cells and to show the immune system how its own cells would appear if infected by FIV. So we wanted to produce, to engineer the autologous T lymphocytes just to show the virus to, to get a cell that from in the outer part is equal to the to the uh, an infected cell and to show these these cells to the immune system so that the immune system can learn or to learn to distinguish how these sun cells would appear if infected by the FIV. So in the engineering, I will show you uh, later on, would be to, to get cells which are continually expression, expressing and uh, um, presenting on the outer surface the whole um, AMP, FIV AMP, and also since we wanted to increase the uh, immunogenicity of these cells, we also have cells which are expressing and release the IL-15 to increase their uh, visibility. So the vaccination was as follows. So <coughs> we, um, we, we, we choose a prime boost approach. So the animals were vaccinated three times with a DNA plasmid, which is encoding the uh, granulocyte uh, GMCSF and DM, the same member was used to engineer the cells. 
So the, the animals were inoculated at 0, 3, and 12 weeks uh, with three, 300 uh, micrograms of, of DNA that was given intradermally. So the DNA vaccination by itself doesn't work. In, in, in the animals or in, in the FIV, we also publish uh, other people who publish things. So we don't we don't have a very good protection, but he obviously can work if you combine to uh, to um, other other uh, you know other vaccines. So so again, so the animals were primed three times with a, with a plasmid that was encoding GMCSF and the M, and the animals were then boosted nine weeks after the third boost with a, a very tiny amount of, of uh, cells of autologous T lymphocytes that were transduced to express M and the IEL15. I would say it's a tiny amount because we used from, T, uh, from 2 to 8 or 10 million, million cells, so very, very small amount. So the animals, nine weeks after, after uh, the last boost, were challenged with a virus which was very, very strong. We have a plasma preparation, so a full, fully virulent virus, and we monitor the take of infection or protection for 10 months. Obviously, uh, along this time, the animals were mo uh, monitored for uh, cell-mediated immune response, humoral response, and so on. Uh, well, the 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 well the the the, pri the priming so the, the plasmid was able to uh, express and and produce the the env in a very high amount uh, for a prolonged uh, period of time and it was also releasing the GMCSF. The reason why we use the GMCSF was also because we want to recruit at the inoculum site granulocyte and macrophages to increase the taking up of, of the plasmid. So this is how we produce, we produce the, uh, we engineered the cells. So the animals, we took the, the, the cells from, from the animals, we took about uh, 10 ml of peripheral blood. We, we purified the, the, the cells, the PBMCs with uh, FICO. We co-stimulate. We wanted to minimize the in vitro culture of the cells. We co-stimulate for 16 hours in the presence of IL-2 and uh, CONA, and then we transduce the cells with a virus, with a, with a pseudotype of particles which were producing 293 cells a couple of days uh, before, and the virus and, and the vector was derived from the FIV, and the vector was expressing the, uh, the uh, full length and, and the IL-15. So the cells were transduced and the day after were, were inoculated. So again, so we took, we took the, the cells from the animals, so 10 ml of peripheral blood cells, we purified the cells, we co-stimulated for 16 hours in the presence of IL-2 and CONA, and we, after this incubation we transduced the cells and the cells were uh, re-inoculated in the animal uh, one day after, so a couple of days after the, 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 the bleeding. Okay. So those are the cells which were able to inoculate. So the cells were expressing very high amount of, of the EMV. The EMV was processed in a, in the very, in the very same, uh, same way as is, of course, in cells which were chronically infected by the, um, the FEL4. And the cells were also expressed on the surface. The, 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 the glycoproteins and also, and finally, the cells were also releasing um, IL-15. So we took the supernatant and we used the supernatant to stimulate cells which were dependent, uh, uh, C, T, I don't remember the name of cells, so that were dependent for the growth by the presence of the IL-15. So those cells were, again, so were obtained from the animals, were co-stimulated for 16 hours, and then were transduced, and this is what we observe the day after transduction. So, um, again, uh, expression of the of the of the M on the surface. Uh, they, they were, you know, the processing seems to be uh, quite nice. So we also did in uh, in T lymphoid cells in uh, in culture, and we observed that the expression could last for uh, at least a couple of weeks. So, or as so long the the, the 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 cells could survive on in vitro, and also the cells were releasing the IL-15, which was also um, biologically active. So these are um, 
again, so we we monitor the we monitor the um, immune uh, the immune response at the you know uh, uh, three weeks uh, uh, three weeks after after so three weeks after the first boost three weeks after the uh, the um, uh, third priming at boost and three weeks after after the boost and at the day of a challenge so those are the results so. <coughs> These are the mock vaccines. The mock vaccines were seven animals, which were actually no four animals. Sorry, uh, four animals which were uh, vaccinated at the same time with the empty vaccine or empty particles. So particles which were assembled and produced without uh, without a vector inside. And these are the response that we observe that we observe from the animals, from the vaccinated animals. So we have seven vaccinated animals. So these are the um, uh, these are the CTL activity, and this is the the early spot. So for interferon gamma production, we observe a moderate uh, res a CTL response that is, uh, has been triggered by the DNA plasma. But we were very very surprised that. Again, after you know, one single inoculation with a teeny, a tiny amount of cells, so from two to ten million <coughs> cells were reinoculated into the animals. So we could observe a very sharp increase of of, of uh, the uh, cellular immunity. So again, if you see, and this uh, the, the obviously the, cell, the the extent of immunity of the cellular response tend to decline, but was still very high uh, at time of challenge. So the red red arrow indicate the time of challenge. So to cut a long story short, we also observe, so as, as regarding the, 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 uh, the uh, humor response, none of those animals were, or the vaccinated animals were antibody response positive at time of boost. But they were, all of them were positive uh, at challenge, so I mean uh, nine weeks after the boost. So again, so the DNA inoculation didn't induce any detectable antibody, and this was, uh, you know, we, we, this was expected because we knew that DNA vaccination only due to CTL activity. So we have all those animals de develop a, a good neutral, a good um, uh, humor response, and but what was most importantly, most important was that all of them develop some neutralizing antibodies. So not only the, 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 um, the boost was able to, to stimulate the cellular immunity, but it was also able to produce a humoral response. So this is, so at, at day uh, uh, 30 weeks, we challenged the animals, and the animals were done with 10 cast infectious doses, and the, and the challenge was given, was given intraperitoneally, so it was a, a systemic challenge. So this is the, the outcome of, of, uh, of challenge. So the, the red line indicate the, the viremia and the blue indicate the uh, provider law. So these are the mock vaccines and these are four challenge controls, age matched, they were naive animals, they were never be treated. If you see the challenge readily infected all animals. There was one animal that died uh, three weeks later for a renal failure. We don't know if it was related to a VIV infection, but so again, we lose, unfortunately, we, lo we lose these, these animals. And also the, the vaccine was able, so the, the, uh, the challenge was also able to infect all the mock vaccines. So eight of eight uh, controls were, were infected. So these are the results that we observe in the vaccinated animals. Uh, I put this because I need for, for the following slide. So there were two animals, this guy, and uh, this guy here, they were uh, totally protected. We could never observe any single trace of infection along 10 months of observation. So those animals were completely protected. So there were three animals, these, these, and these, in which you can see some bleep of arrhenia. So they were, they were not protected, but they were really able to keep infection under control. And there were two animals, so they were not protected. So again, these guys completely, pr totally protected. These three uh, partially protected, and those animals that were not protected. But if you look at the uh, CD4 
decline, again, the CD4 decline is a hallmark of disease, as you observe. So the CD4 decline, let's say, look at the, the um, percentage. So the red continuous line is the CD4. So the CD4 decline in all animal, all controls. So there are no animals in which the, 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 the CD4 um, was stable across the 10 month of observation. So this is what we observe. Again, and obviously as expected, there were no decline in those animals. So the lines were stable, but there was also no decline in the three protected animals. So uh, I would say the partially protected animals. Again, if you remember, I will show you that in these three animals, there were some bleeps of aremia. So the animals couldn't resist the infection, but they definitely could, uh, were protected from, from disease because they were not CD4 decline. And even here, in those animals that were not protected, here you see uh, as, you know, uh, as some sort of decline, not very uh, not a steep decline like in these animals, but in these, uh, these animals were stable. So again, at the end of this experiment, almost uh, three years of work is, and so what? What are the correlator protections? So we try to match, we, we, we try to, com to compare protection and varimia titers with the, all the immunological parameters that we uh, that we uh, um, uh, skip, skip this. So <coughs> again, the results, the, so what is the, the correlate to protect? Is there anything that we can infer from the study? Well, it turns out that when we monitor, when we try to look at the immunological parameters, obviously if you, if you, moni if you compare the, uh, the controls and the vaccines, you see that uh, Obviously, you know, all the immunological parameters have some role in protection, but when we analyze within the vaccine, so what is the difference between the uh, totally protected animals or partially protected and versus the non-protected? What is the immunological parameter which is, seems to play uh, an important role? Well, well, it turned out that the Either they totally protect and it, 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 they both totally and partially protected have a higher uh, neutralizing antibodies at challenge and for the three months after, after challenge. So the, the five animals which were, uh, I would say, totally or partially protected have uh, a higher neutralizing antibodies uh, tighter as compared to the non-protected animals. And it was strongly significant. And I would say that was strange because when we um, plot the experiments in the beginning, and obviously we were thinking a way to stimulate the cellular immunity because we know that at the end, so we were thinking that probably if we are able to, to get a good cellular immunity that actually we did, we, we, well, we have unexpectedly and uncommonly high levels of, of CTL immunity are challenged and for, the, for the several months after. But this, uh, uh, apparently with the, with, the data, with the data that we have at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any significant differences between the protected versus the non-protected. What the difference we observe is the, the neutralizing antibody type. So to summarize, so to, to summarize, so the, the prime boost vaccination elicited strong antiviral and same mediated humor uh, and humor response. And upon challenge, two out of seven animals were fully protected. Three developed a low grade infection, but they had normal CD40 cell counts, and they are still. Okay, we obviously at the end of the experiments, the animals were given on adoption. We are not allowed to, to kill the animals or to, I would say, to euthanize the animals to do some pathological study. The, the uh, international law, uh, you know, uh, they are not, we are not allowed to do any more like we did in the 90s. I know this sounds strange and obviously I wouldn't, you know, wh when the first I was, uh, this in, uh, you know, out of, uh, I would say almost out of the regs, but no, that is not true. But obviously I, I think it's silly to give on adoption and, and animals which is infected. Also because the people who get these is because they also have, they love animals, they have a lot of animals, but in spite of these, uh, people who want these animals, and so we, uh, we monitor those animals in the distance, but these animals are still alive and kicking and still very well. So again, there are two 
fully protected, three would develop a low grade of infection, and two or seven were uh, partially protected. And the eye titers, the eye uh, neutralized antibody types are pair pivotal in the protection of the vaccine. So what, what are the future directions, what we are doing now with these? Well, <coughs> these first two points are done in collaboration with a guy uh, who was working with a non-human primates who was working in Netherlands, now he moved in uh, his lab in Cambridge, uh, Cambridge, UK. So uh, together with him, we are trying to identify this guy, is Jonathan Heaney, a very, very famous guy in the field of, vac of HIV and uh, HIV vaccinology. So we were trying to identi identify the uh, genetic changes that occur under the pressure of pre-existing anti uh, neutralizing antibodies. So we, we are monitor, so we are starting to monitor the, uh, the virus that arose from the animals which were uh, not protected and from those which were partially protected. We want to see how the virus change, or so the variation in the end to see how the virus could you know, persist and give a, you know, a persistent replication uh, in uh, despite an, a pre-existing uh, neutralizing of body. So we want to compare to the, the, the virus which emerged along uh, uh, after, after the child. And also we want to manage to map the neutralizing antibodies responses that were associated with the protection and especially to evaluate the spectrum of neutralizing activity. So we are currently see if the neutralizing antibodies that we uh, originate with these were qualitatively better as compared to the neutralizing antibodies that we originate with uh, uh, other, other vaccines. So we are currently testing the neutralizing activity against isolates of difference up there. Obviously, we, if uh, depending on the grants that we, uh, we, we obtain for, for this study, we want to assess the breadth of protection against heterologous challenges. We would like to test against uh, you know, inter or different, uh, different clays. And we will also to improve, and this has already been in progress, we will also to improve our vectors to extend the immunization to GAG and test against the mucosal challenge because obviously mucosa is much more difficult to protect. And since it's uh, 10 past 10, uh, 10 past one, sorry, I think uh, if you are, um, I'm, I'm stopping here, I skip to the third part or it's up to you. Anyway, the main contributions or uh, contributions for these studies were Francesca Bonci and Elisa Zaboli who made uh, the, the vaccine. Obviously, it's against to cut a long story short because we had to uh, improve our, our vector uh, to, to get a very good and sustained expression in autologous T cells. And also, we had to find a way to transduce it. The, the cells were transducing somewhere in between to 40 to 70%. Uh, uh, with, the, with the method that we developed. And then Francesca Conte and Fabrizio Maggi who made some uh, immunological assays and made all the statistical analysis. And Mauro Bendinelli who, despite, uh, despite he retired a couple of years ago, is still my scientific mentor and I'm very proud of it. So if um, I, can, I can stop here or, or show you the, the third part. It's really up to you. But 